Welcome to the RF Knock 3 workshop. My name is Neil Pandia. The workshop is divided into two parts. I'll be presenting the first part, and Jonathan Pendlum will be presenting the second part. In part one, we'll introduce the RF Knock framework and give an overview of its architecture. We'll then show a couple of real time demonstrations of RF Knock in action. In part two, we'll take a deeper dive into RF Knock and look closely at the software architecture and the, hard and the FPGA hardware architecture. We'll then go through an exercise of creating a new RF knock block from scratch and integrating it into UHD and GNU Radio. We'll also discuss some advanced topics. Let's start by taking a look at the current situation with SDR processing. Most often, SDR applications run on the General Purpose Processor, or GPP, or simply the CPU, or the host computer. This can be a laptop, as shown in the slide, or a server computer, or an embedded computer. Applications can be written in many different languages and tool chains, such as C++, Python, and GNU Radio. For those who are new to GNU Radio, GNU Radio is an open source framework for SDR processing. Programs in GNU Radio are called flow graphs. Flow graphs can be written in C++ or Python and can be constructed visually using the GNU Radio Companion or GRC tool as shown in this screenshot. The CPU takes advantage of multiple processing cores as well as instruction sets that support parallel data processing such as SIMD on Intel CPUs and NEON on ARM CPUs in order to accelerate processing. Some applications leverage the GPU to accelerate processing using libraries such as OpenCL and CUDA. One popular application is Phosphor shown here in the screenshot which displays a real-time GPU accelerated spectrum display. Increasingly, applications are using the FPGA to accelerate processing. The FPGA is attractive for several reasons. It provides dedicated hardware resources, so it is capable of handling especially high-rate data streams, supporting very wide bandwidths. It is also well positioned in the signal chain, being close to the antenna, closer than the GPU. These features make the FPGA ideal for many operations such as DSP for sampling rate changes, filtering, and channelization. The table on this slide shows the resources and clock rates for the FPGAs in successive USRP devices. The Generation 1 FPGA was small and slow, and there was no space for any user-defined logic. The Generation 2 FPGAs were somewhat faster and larger, and provided at least some resources for user-defined logic. The Generation 3 FPGAs are faster and larger still, and also provide significantly more resources for user-defined logic. The trend is that FPGAs are getting faster and providing more and more resources that can be used by the SDR applications to accelerate processing. And we're at a, we're at a really good point today where significant user-defined logic can be practically added to the FPGA. Let's illustrate the challenges in SDR processing. The screenshot at the bottom of the slide is from a GNU radio flow graph which implements Welch's algorithm for power spectrum estimation for 200 megahertz of bandwidth on a channel on the USRP X310 radio. There are significant processing requirements on the CPU in this application. An FFT magnitude squared operation and moving average are to be performed on the data stream at 200 mega samples per second. In addition, a graphical widget is to be displayed showing the result in real time. Note that the math in this application can be parallelized and so it is a good candidate for being done on the FPGA. The math is one of two stresses on the CPU. The other is the consumption of the IQ samples from the radio at 200 megasample per second. This represents 6.4 gigabits per second, 
which is in itself a heavy load for the CPU to sustain. With a heavy load such as this, the CPU will face additional challenges around latency and determinism, which are often critical to some applications. It could become difficult to achieve precise timing and maintain proper data flow with this kind of load. The FPGA can help with all of these challenges. As the USRP radios have an FPGA, and recent devices have larger FPGAs that can provide significant additional horsepower, the FPGA code is open source, the schematics are openly available online, and the host side driver is also open source. So with all of these capabilities, why don't more people use the FPGA? As a side note, the photo on this slide shows the USRP X310 motherboard, and the large black component on the right side of the photo is the heatsink for the FPGA. The FPGAs can run very hot. Well, compared to the CPU, or even the GPU, FPGAs are harder to use and are slower to develop on. Not as many engineers are familiar with FPGA programming. Many engineering curriculums do not include any FPGA programming topics or courses. Doing math and hardware is hard. It's much easier to implement the math for an algorithm on the CPU. Often engineers specialize and focus on particular skill segments, such as theoretical algorithm development, software engineering, and FPGA design. It's difficult and uncommon for an engineer or a team to have all the capabilities in all of the skill areas. The goal with the RFNOC framework is to make FPGA acceleration more accessible on the USRP platform. RFNOC provides both software infrastructure and FPGA infrastructure to facilitate integrating user-defined functions and logic through standard and simple, straightforward interfaces. The RFNOC framework is open source. It can be used directly from C++, and you can also use it from GNU Radio. The upper part of the slide shows a screenshot of a GNU Radio flow graph that implements a real-time spectrum display. The lower part of the slide shows a diagram of the RFNOC framework. The red dotted line indicates the boundary between the host computer, or the CPU, running the UHD driver, and the FPGA. The radio core block provides the connection between the FPGA and other components in the radio, such as the RF front end and the ADCs and the DACs. For receive operations, IQ samples are output from the radio core block. For transmit operations, IQ samples are input into the radio core block. The Ethernet, MAC, and PHY interface provide the connection to the host computer over a 1 gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet, or PCI Express interface. Multiple parallel Ethernet interfaces can be instantiated, depending on the particular radio. Custom user-defined logic is put into RF knock blocks, which are sometimes called computation engines, or CEs. Multiple RF knock blocks can be instantiated. The crossbar connects all the components in the RFNOC framework, such as the Ethernet MAC and PHY interface, the radio core block, and all the other RFNOC blocks, or CEs. All data in RFNOC is passed in a packetized format, so the crossbar is essentially a packet switch. The crossbar is fully connected, meaning that each component connected to the crossbar is connected to all the other components that are connected to the crossbar. The name of the framework, RFNOC, or RF Network on Chip, comes from this architecture. The RFNOC API within the host side UHD device driver provides a way for the framework to be configured from the software application program running on the CPU, 
It provides an interface for the user application program to send and receive data to and from RFNOC blocks, and also to control RFNOC blocks by reading and writing user-defined registers in the RFNOC blocks. The user application can be a standalone C++ program, or it can be a GNU Radio flow graph. Let's consider an example of plotting frequency spectrum to see how RFNOC is used from within GNU Radio and to see what the data flow looks like. As mentioned earlier, received IQ samples are output from the radio core block. Note that the radio core block is represented by an RFNOC specific block in the GNU Radio flow graph with the prefix RFNOC in the block's name. The corresponding data flow on the FPGA is illustrated by the solid red line in the diagram. Recall that all data flow between blocks and the host computer must pass through the crossbar. Now let's assume that we want to push the FFT operation from the CPU to the FPGA. To do this, we would instantiate an, RF, an FFT RF knock block in the FPGA. Note that this would have to be done ahead of time and not at runtime. An FPGA bitstream that includes an FFT block must already be loaded onto the FPGA. We then change the host based FFT GNU Radio block in the GRC GNU Radio flow graph to an RF knock FFT block. Notice that the arrow between the radio core block has changed from black to green. This indicates that the data flow occurs on the FPGA. Black arrows between blocks indicate that the data flow occurs on the CPU, as is normally the convention in GNU Radio. A black green dashed arrow indicates that the data flow is going between the CPU and the FPGA, as is the case for the output from the RFNOC FFT block, going into the complex to magnitude block. The corresponding data flow on the FPGA is illustrated by the solid red line in the diagram. If it's decided that additional blocks should be on the FPGA instead of on the CPU, then those additional blocks can be instantiated in the FPGA and connected in GNU Radio. These connections are dynamic and can be changed at runtime. Let's take a closer look at the internals of an RF knock block, as shown by the diagram here. Again, the red arrows indicate the data flow. So here we have IQ samples coming in from the ADC into the radio core block and then being routed to the FFT, the RFNOC FFT block. Recall that all data is packetized in RFNOC. So every block has a depacketizer and packetizer at its inputs and outputs, respectively. There is also a FIFO for flow control. All the items in green are provided by the RFNOC framework. The item in pink is your custom logic, and this would be provided and defined by the user. All user-defined logic, or IP, interfaces to the RFNOC framework through an AXI stream interface. As long as your IP speaks AXI, AXI stream, then you can integrate it into the RFNOC framework. AXI Stream is an industry standard and is not a proprietary standard from National Instruments or Edis Research. AXI Stream is widely used and there are many third-party IP cores that use AXI Stream. There are several sources for the user-defined IP. Users may certainly write their own custom IP in Verilog or VHDL Users may also use the IP from Xilinx, since Xilinx Avado is used to build FPGA images. 
There is free open source IP from opencores.org as well as from Theseus Cores. Many third-party companies provide libraries of IP that can be used and integrated. It is also possible to use Xilinx High-Level Synthesis, or HLS, to auto-generate Verilog and VHDL IP from C++ source code. Each RF knock block is clocked in its own separate clock domain. This clock domain may be the same as the rest of the design or may be different. This can sometimes be useful to improve processing throughput as well as to help meet timing constraints when building the FPGA bitstream. The block's interface to the crossbar contains FIFOs which handle the crossing between clock domains. Let's consider the hypothetical case of a cognitive radio. Here we have IQ samples received by the radio core block being routed to the RF knock FFT block. In this example, the FFT block comes from the Xilinx IP library. The resulting spectrum is then sent to a spectrum policy block, which presumably analyzes the spectrum, looking to raise an alert based on some criteria. When the spectrum policy block sees something of interest, say for example energy in a specific bin, or energy across multiple bins, perhaps averaged over some time period, then it sends a trigger command to the TX modulator block, which in this example was created from C++ code using Vivado HLS. When the TX modulator block receives the trigger command, it obtains a payload of specific IQ samples from the host. Upon receipt of the payload, the TX modulator block then immediately transmits those samples at some prescribed sampling rate, RF frequency, and gain value. The example is meant to illustrate that the latency in the system's response to the trigger condition is much lower when implemented on the FPGA than would be possible when the system is implemented on the CPU, in which case the IQ samples would have to be continuously streamed from the radio to the host computer over Ethernet, and the FFT and spectrum policy functions would have to be performed in the CPU, perhaps within some uh, tight set of sampling uh, timing requirements. In summary, RFNOC aims to make USRP FPGA programming more accessible to the user. It's tightly integrated with GNU Radio, although RFNOC can also be used from C++. The RFNOC framework includes a library of blocks from Edis Research, such as a phosphor block, an FIR filter block, an FFT block, a signal generator block, and a keep one and end block. RFNOC is supported on all third generation devices, such as the X300, the X310, the N300, the N310, N320 and N321, and the embedded radios, the E310, the E312, and the E320. And again, the RFNOC framework, as well as the host side UHD driver, are completely open source. I will now show my screen and run some RFNOC demonstrations. In the interest of time, I'll run two of the four demonstrations the phosphor spectrum display demo, and the signal generator demo. You can download these, sli uh, these slides in the VM, VM image from our website and run the same demos yourself locally on your computer. The hardware that I'm using is a USRP X310 with a WBX daughter board. Any daughter board should work. I'm running these demos from within the VM using VirtualBox 6.1.10 the host operating system is Ubuntu 20.04, and the guest OS here in the VM is Ubuntu 18.04. As I bring up the demos, you'll see how the system is used. There is a script in the RFNOC workshop folder, 
that will configure our environment. So I will source that script first and then I will invoke GNU Radio Companion. I'll run the Phosphor demo first. I'll just run it and I'll come back and explain the flow graph. Because I'm using the WBX daughter board, my tuning range is between 50 and 2200 megahertz. It's named Foster, Phosphor because it tries to emulate the persistence and ghosting effects in the displays of the old Phosphor CRT-based spectrum analyzers from 20 years ago. Phosphor can be run on the CPU or on the GPU or on the FPGA. Here, of course, we're running on the FPGA. It can also be run as a standalone tool. Here, of course, I'm running it from within my GNU Radio flow graph. The upper half of the display is the FFT display, and the lower half is the waterfall display, showing historical spectral information over time. The sampling rate that I'm using is 100 mega sample per second, and so we're capturing 100 megahertz of real-time spectrum. And since all the math is running on the FPGA, the CPU is very lightly loaded. For example, using Phosphor on the FPGA, you could visualize 200 megahertz of spectrum across two channels, so that would be 400 megahertz of spectrum total, in real time with minimal CPU overhead. You could run that, in fact, on a, on a very underpowered computer and a very inexpensive computer. I'll first tune to 568 megahertz. In the United States, the region from 512 to 608 megahertz contains ATSC digital uh, television stations, which are each 6 megahertz wide. I'm located at the NI head office in Austin, Texas. Here you can see two local stations being received. It looks like there are, uh, these are channels 33 at 584 megahertz, this one here, and channel 34 at 590 megahertz. I believe these stations are KVUE and KEYE, or KI, which are local here in Austin. Okay, next I'll tune to 315 megahertz. Most key fobs for cars operate at either around 315 or 434 megahertz. I've seen a few operating also in the 915 megahertz ISM band. You can always check the FCC ID of your key fob to determine what frequency it operates at. The FCC ID for the key fob for my Honda reports a frequency of 313.85 megahertz. So notice the phosphor display as I click the key fob. I'll click it a few times. You can see that short signal appear in the phosphor display. That's the transmission from the fob to the car to lock and unlock the vehicle. Thank goodness that modern key fobs use rolling codes, otherwise you could do a record and playback attack where you record the transmitted unlock signal and play it back to unlock my car without the key fob being present. Okay, lastly, I'll tune to 850 megahertz. Eight hundred fifty megahertz is LTE band five, which runs from eight twenty four megahertz to eight forty nine megahertz for the uplink, and for the downlink eight hundred sixty nine to eight hundred ninety four megahertz. Uh, T Mobile uses band five, and perhaps other mobile phone carriers do as well. We can see from the display that there are some downlink signals from some nearby base stations or E Node Bs. It looked like 
it looks like there's one 5 megahertz carrier at 869 megahertz. I'll increase my gain here. And there is some intermittent and ephemeral activity on the uplink between 830 and 840 megahertz. Also notice the two other 1.5 and 5 megahertz downlink carriers at about 857 and 859 megahertz and between 863 and 868 megahertz. Those are band 26, which is used by Sprint. Okay, next I'll go to the second demo, which is the signal generator demo. Actually, before I do that, let me go back to the phosphor demo and explain how this works. So, here we have the RF knock radio core block, and this is where the, the received IQ samples come from. They're then sent through a digital down converter, a DDC, which converts the sample rate from 200 down to 100. We then apply a window and take the FFT, and the samples are sent to this RF knock phosphor block. This block is where the FFT and histogram calculations are performed. Notice the green arrows between the blocks, which indicate that the data flow is occurring on the FPGA. We then go through a DMA FIFO and a FIFO for buffering, and then to the host. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice that the line here is dashed green and black to indicate that the data flow goes from the FPGA to the host computer. There's a copy block which in this case may not be strictly necessary given that there's only one output. And the data is then sent to this RF knock QT phosphor display block. Note that although this block has the word Q, uh, RF knock in it, it is not an RF knock block in that it's not running on the FPGA, it's running on the host. This is evident from the fact that the arrows going into it are black in color, not green, and that the RF knock prefix doesn't have a colon before it. The, the, the word RF knock is part of the name itself of the block, not a prefix. This RF knock QT phosphor display block is what's responsible for drawing that, that GUI widget, that graphical interface, and taking the histogram and FFT data from the FPGA and displaying it on the screen. No calculation is being performed on the host, however. Okay, and then going back to the signal generator block, in this flow graph, we'll show the use of the signal generator block to generate a sine wave on the FPGA, and then say, send the signal to the host computer to, be, to be displayed in the time domain and in the frequency domain. Practically speaking, there's little reason to generate a tone on the FPGA for use on the host computer. But this is just being done here to illustrate a simple use case for the signal generator block. So here we have the signal generator block generating the, the tone. Notice we're not even using the radio core block in this case. So in effect, we're sort of using the FPGA as a hardware coprocessor. We're not even using the radio functionality of the USRP. The sig signal generator block synthesizes a sine wave on the FPGA, which is then sent over to the host computer. The throttle block rate limits the samples to one mega sample per second. Those samples are then sent to Q, uh, two QT graphical widgets to show the signal in the time domain and the frequency domain. I'll go ahead and run that. When I run the flow graph, the time domain and frequency domain uh, displays appear at the bottom and on the top are sliders to change the frequency and the gain. And as I change the frequency and the gain, you can see the displays update correspondingly.
Remember that this sine wave is not coming from the radio. It's not something that's being transmitted over the air and received. It's being synthesized by the FPGA in that signal generator block. This concludes part one of the RF knock workshop. Jonathan Pendler will now present part two. Thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Jonathan Pendlum, and I'm from Edis Research. This is part two of the RF knock 3 workshop. In part two, we will do a deep dive into the FPGA and software architecture of RF knock We will also do some hands-on development of our own custom RF knock block. Finally, I will connect, cover a few advanced topics in RF knock Much of this workshop will involve using the RF knock 3 workshop virtual machine. If you want to follow along, make sure you have the VM running. Now let's get started. In part one, we gave an overview of the RFNOC framework and how it is split between the FPGA and software components. But how do we get these individual components? There are two main ways to install them. One, through PyBombs, or two, manually installing all dependencies and building from source. PyBomb stands for the Python Build Overlay Managed Bundle System, which is a dependency and install management system for GNU Radio Out of Tree modules. Basically, PyBombs handles installing dependencies and building from source for you. You could also do those steps yourself. I won't cover that in this workshop, but we do have knowledge base articles showing you the whole process. For the VM, we used PyBombs. For our custom RF knock block to be supported in GNU Radio, we need to create what is called an out of tree module. An out of tree module is a GNU Radio component that does not live within the GNU Radio source tree. Typically, we use them to add additional blocks to GNU Radio. GNU Radio has a program called GR Mod Tool to help us create an out of tree module. It handles setting up the directory structure and necessary CMake files. For RF knock, we have a few additional files like the FPGA source code for our block that needs to be included. So we created a program based on GR mod tool called RFNOC mod tool to help us create an out of tree module with the additional files necessary for our RFNOC block. Those additional files include the block's Verilog code, test bench code, UHD C++ block controller, knock script XML, and other files associated with GNU Radio Companion. The nice part about this out of tree module is that everything is in one place. So let's go over how to use RFNOC mod tool. And this begins our hands on portion of the workshop. So, first, in the virtual machine, go ahead and open up a terminal window. You'll want to navigate to the RFNOC workshop directory, which is in the home directory. If you run ls, you can see that there's various files in here. One of them is setup underscore env.sh. That sets up environmental variables that allow us to access programs such as RFNOC mod tool. This is something that came from PyBombs. So if we source setup env.sh, we now have access to RFNOC mod tool, and we can run help to see what it's all about. Those familiar with GR mod tool will see that this output is very similar. Now we are at the first part of our hands-on tutorial. Our custom block will be a simple digital gain block, which will multiply an input sample stream by a value that can be changed at runtime. Let's use RFNOC mod tool to create an out of, me, out of tree module for our block. So first, let's navigate to the source directory. One thing I'd like to know as we go through the workshop, if you ever run into issues, you can always go into the RFNOC tutorial complete directory to get the full design and, and all the work that we've done is in here and completed. So if you make any mistakes or run into strange errors, just go ahead and hop into that directory and, and compare the code in there with the code that you've written. 
Now using RFNOC mod tool, if we look at the help message, we can see that there's an option called new mod, which allows us to create a new out of tree module. So let's use RFNOC mod tool new mod to create an out of tree module called tutorial. And if we run ls, we can see that indeed we now have a directory called rfnoc tutorial. Next, let's add our gain block to this out of tree module. So we run rfnoc new mod, excuse me, rfnoc mod tool again. And this time we run the add option to insert our block called gain. And it helps if you're in the directory, which is a step that I skipped. So let's try that again. Now you can see that we've added this block called gain. And it wants us to include an argument list. We can just skip this, hit return. Add QA code for Python, sure. C++, sure. We can skip both of those by hitting enter which will choose the default option of no. We will not be creating any QA code during this workshop for our block. Next, we have the block knock ID in hexadecimal. I'll cover later what the knock ID is all about, but for, no, for now, just go ahead and enter the values from the slide, which is E7757, E5700000, Zero, 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 0001. Skip block controller generation. No. We'll take the default value. Here we'll take the default value as well, which is to not skip the block file interface generation, the block interface files generation. And now we can see that a lot of files were created here. Let's take a quick look at the, the directory structure of our RFNOC tutorial out of tree module. So we can see that there's various directories here. Those that are familiar with GR mod tool and out of tree modules likely understand what this directory structure is. If you're not, I would suggest taking a look with the GNU radio tutorials as I won't go over every different directory here. I'm only going to go over the ones that are more pertinent to RFNOC. One right here you can see is RF, the RFNOC directory. If we go into there, we can see that there is a blocks, FPGA source, and test benches uh, directories. So blocks is where our NOC script XML lives, which I'll explain later what is Knock uh, script. FPGA source is self explanatory. That's where our HDL code lives for our block. In this case, we just have a, one Verilog file. And test benches are for the test benches for our FPGA code. In this case, we have just a knock block game TB that was automatically created, and it created a system Verilog test bench file. All these are skeleton files that have some sort of default functionality already built in, kind of like a loopback test. But we're going to later on go into these files and add our own tests and our own logic. We also have in the GRC directory, we already have a GNU Radio Companion XML file set up for us. It's also a skeleton file. We'll need to fill that out. And in the lib directory, we have various C++ files for both UHD and GNU Radio. This is the block controller for UHD. This is the block implementation file for GNU Radio. And if we look into the include directory, we can see the associated header files. We used RFNOC mod tool to create our gain block, but it only contains skeleton code. We need to go through three steps to fully implement our block. 
the FPGA implementation, which will be writing Verilog code, the software implementation, which will be writing the block controller, and the process to integrate our block into GNU Radio. First, we will go over the FPGA implementation. Let's open our knock block gain Verilog code, which is located in the directory structure above, listed in the slide. The virtual machine has several editor choices. I'll be using mousepad throughout this workshop. Since we're already in the RFNOC tutorial directory, we just need to go into RFNOC and then FPGA source. And then here we'll see that there's the knock block gain .v file. That's our Verilog code. And I've opened it now with mousepad. This is a high level overview of our gain blocks FPGA implementation. In the upper right, you can see the value that we entered when creating our block with RFNOC mod tool. Each block has a unique 64-bit ID called a NOC ID. The IDs are used by software to differentiate blocks from each other. If we go back to our code, we can see right here that the NOC ID is a parameter, an input parameter to the block. And we can see it matches the value that we put into our FNOC mod tool. There's another parameter below it called stream sync FIFO size. This is an advanced parameter that's related to flow control. Generally, you don't need to touch it. You can just leave it at 11 or whatever default value happens to be there. Each block has one connection to the crossbar. And the crossbar and this through this connection is how blocks communicate to each other and the host. If we were to go back to our code, we see that there is two buses on lines 29 and 30 that are the input and output buses as depicted on the block diagram. Each block has one connection to the crossbar, which are these signals. And these signals are output and input axis streams. Over these axis stream connections, we carry cheddar packets, which I'll discuss later. What does cheddar mean and what's the packet structure? We also have several clock and reset values or clock and reset signals here. The connections to the crossbar use the bus clock for their clock domain. The user logic uses the CE clock for its clock domain. Technically, these clocks could be the same clock, or they could be different. Generally, you might want different clocks if you want to clock your user logic perhaps faster or maybe slower than the clock that runs the crossbar and other parts of the RFNOC design. This can be useful if, say, your particular block requires several clock cycles to do an operation on a sample. And so perhaps you'll clock your code faster so it can still output a sample per every bus clock cycle. Conversely, maybe you clock it more slowly because your logic has a lot of uh, long logic paths and runs into timing issues at faster clock rates. And so you run your, your code, your logic slower to make timing easier. Finally, there is a debug signal. Generally, it's not used for anything. Uh, perhaps in some very advanced use cases, you might put some signals on there to make debugging a bit easier. In general, I would just advise to uh, ignore that signal. 
Now I mentioned AxiStream several times, but not everybody is familiar with AxiStream. What it is, is it's a bus standard that's part of the ARM AMBA standard. The protocol is quite simple. It's a handshake using valid and ready signals called T-valid and T-ready. When both are asserted during the same clock cycle or are ready asserted, the data word called T-data is consumed. And you can see that here in the timing diagram on the bottom. You can see that we have T-valid asserted here for many clock cycles and finally T-ready gets asserted for a few clock cycles and during these clock cycles you can see that on T data here, D0 is consumed, and then D1, and then D2. There's also a signal called T last that is usually indicated to, or usually included to indicate pack, packet boundaries. And we can see on D2, T last is asserted, indicating that D2 is considered the last word of this particular packet. There are a few important points I should bring up to remember about or know about AxiStream. One of them is if tvalid is deasserted, then signals like tdata and tlast have no meaning. Sometimes you'll see tdata and tlast have, might have seemingly random values on them, but when you look at tvalid, you see that it's deasserted or logic level low. What could be happening in the block in that case is that it has some optimizations internally to save resources. And so it ends up just allowing kind of random data on T data and T last that have no meaning, which is perfectly fine because T valid is not asserted. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you may see those random values don't get fooled into thinking there's data flowing because T valid is actually not asserted. Another point to bring up would is, and this is important, once tvalid is asserted, it cannot be deasserted without at least one tready cycle. Basically, when you assert tvalid, you're presenting data on the output on tdata, and you can't take that data away. You have to wait for a tready cycle to consume that output data. And another point to bring up is that T valid cannot wait on T ready to assert as this can cause deadlocks. Or to look at it another way, your block can't just wait for the incoming T ready to assert before it decides to present its own data. And the problem with that is that if your block is waiting for T ready and then the downstream block is waiting for T valid to assert, neither will assert their signals and you end up in a deadlock situation. That's why the standard says that you need to assert T valid, uh, assert it as soon as you can, as soon as ready, valid data is ready uh, to be output and do not wait for the upstream T ready, or excuse me, the downstream T ready. And of course, why actually stream? Well, there's a lot of reasons. It's an industry standard. The vendors out there have lots of IP that use AxiStream. Uh, there's no need for complicated strobes. The nice part is you can take blocks that they're based on AxiStream. You can hook them up together and send data through without worrying about strobing data between them and, and pattern, strobing patterns. Um, that doesn't mean that necessarily those two blocks, their data on T-Data is exactly compatible, but it will be able to flow data between the two of them. And so that sort of builds in the concept of it really enhances reusability and composability of designs. Now earlier I said that the Axi stream connection to the crossbar between our blocks and the crossbar and, and other blocks uses Cheddar. Cheddar stands for compressed header, and it's RFNOX packet format, which consists of a 64 or 128-bit header and a payload. So if we look at the timing diagram below, we can see the first data word here is a header, and then we have a short payload of just the words D0 and D1. 
Here is what the packet protocol looks like. The header may be 64 or 128 bits long. The first 100, or excuse me, the first 64 bits of the header consists of a packet type. And the table here in the bottom explains the sort of different packet types. You have command, response, data, flow control. The header also has at bit 61 a has time flag. If that flag is set to one, then the header will be, instead of 64 bits long, it'll be 128 bits long because it will, on the next 64 bit word, have what is known as a, a fractional time or time stamp, or you also hear the term vita time. Um, they're, they're all synonymous for each other. It's a 60 bit word, 64 bit time stamp that's included in the header. After the has time flag, there is an end of burst flag. That is often used to indicate the end of a stream. Uh, for instance, if you're familiar with USRPs, if you say run your device and your host computer can't keep up, you may see O's in the uh, terminal window indicating overruns on the USRP. Those O's, when they're sent to the host computer to let them know that, that the USRP is not keeping up and having buffer overruns internally, if you were to look at the actual cheddar packet stream coming across, you'd see that right before, before that O, that packet has an end of burst flag that has been set on the packet header. That's, that's one use case of the end of burst flag. After that, there's a 12-bit sequence number, then a 16-bit packet length and bytes. That length includes the header as well. And then there are two stream IDs called the source and destination stream IDs. So what is a stream ID? Well, stream IDs are how RF knock blocks are addressed. Don't confuse these with knock IDs, which uniquely identify the RF knock block type. Stream IDs are more like the network address of the block. They consist of an 8-bit crossbar ID, a 4-bit port number, and a 4-bit block or logical or you can think of as virtual port number. Stream IDs are set up automatically by, each, excuse me, by UHD, so this is mostly for informational purposes only. Uh, you generally, when writing your own RF knock block and using RF knock, won't really care about what are the exact stream ID values unless you're in a unique debugging corner case. So going back to our block diagram, we have this one component at the top called knock shell. Let's go ahead and dive in to knock shell and what it's all about. Knock shell is basically boilerplate code used to interface our block's core logic with the rest of RF knock. It takes care of muxing and demuxing those cheddar packets I brought up before. I spoke of one packet known as a flow control packet, so that indicates to us that RF knock has a flow control protocol and knock shell handles that protocol for us transparently. It also handles crossing clock domains. Earlier I brought up the bus clock and the CE clock domains it handles the, the crossing of clock domains internally, so we don't have to. The tagline to RF knock shell is really, it's handling all of the RF knock framework and infrastructure concepts for us so we can focus on our logic instead of how does our logic interface with the rest of the FPGA and how does it talk to the host, all those concepts. That's the main purpose of RF knock is to, is to take care of that for us so we can focus on our logic. In the code, starting at line number 57, right here, we can see at the top of knock shell, there is two parameters called the knock ID and the stream sync FIFO size. Of course, we remember those from earlier coming into our module as parameters. 
we have in Knox shell connections to the crossbar. Here's our CE clock and CE recess, reset coming into Knox shell, which is going to handle that clock domain crossing for us. We then have here a control sync, but it's also generally called the settings bus. So the settings bus is what we use to read and write our user registers. Now I'm going to go ahead and skip forward to a couple of slides in the future so we can go over the settings bus. So the settings bus has two phases here, a write phase and a readback phase. And you can see that here on the block di or excuse me, the timing diagram here on the bottom. So we have in the write phase, the signal set strobe, set adder, and set data. And then in the readback phase, we see the, the signals RB strobe, RB data being exercised. So the idea here is that the RF knock block will receive a control packet where the payload has an address and data that will be put on these set adder and set data signals along with asserting a set strobe. And later on, we will see how those signals tie into another module called a settings register to allow us to realize a user register. Now, when it comes to the readback data and readback strobe signals, those which flow into Knox shell will trigger a response packet, which will go back to the block or to the host computer that sent us our original control packet. And the idea here, as I said, is we receive control packets to write registers and we send out response packets as a readback mechanism. And later on in the uh, presentation here, we'll have more details on this. The next slide here talks about our register address space when it comes to setting registers. The set adder signal is 8 bits wide, which means that we could have up to 256 registers. The way that RF knock is set up is that the lower 128 registers are reserved for knock shell and the upper 128 registers are reserved as user registers. So as the user, generally you have up to 128 registers. And if we look on our block diagram, we can see on the right here, this sort of bus that goes down to the user registers, that's our settings bus coming out of Knox shell. Moving on to the next set of signals, our control source, which is the command out and ACK in Axie stream buses. These are used to trigger those settings bus writes and readbacks in other blocks. So for instance, command out is how we're sending the control packet to another block. And ACK in is actually the response packet that comes from that block. We will cover these signals more in depth in the advanced part of this workshop. Most blocks generally do not use this interface, do not have a need to write and read registers from other blocks. That is more of an advanced use case. And here are the command and response packet buses here on our block diagram. Next, we have the stream sync and stream source buses. Now, in this case, these are where the Cheddar data packets come out and go into Knox shell. These are really important. This is where our sample data is located at, which is in the Cheddar data packets. We can see this on, right here in the block diagram. Here is what the internal 
the internals look like for Knox shell. On the left, we can see that incoming and outgoing cheddar packets are demuxed and muxed, respectively, based on packet type. So you have from the crossbar packets coming in, they get demuxed into the data, response, command, flow control packets. And the opposites on the bottom there, data, response, command, and flow control packets are muxed together into a single stream going to the crossbar. And you can see that these are in orange, indicating that they are in the bus clock domain. At the top, we can see that incoming data packets from the crossbar go into a FIFO. The output of that FIFO is observed by the module at the bottom called the flow control response. You can see this sort of dotted line connection here. This is showing RFNOC's implementation of credit-based flow control. The idea is that each RFNOC block has an input FIFO for data packets. The upstream RFNOC block knows both the depth and fullness of the downstream RFNOC block's input data packet FIFO. As the upstream block sends packets to the downstream block, it automatically throttles if the next output packet will overflow the downstream block's FIFO. As the downstream block consumes packets from that FIFO, it informs the upstream block via control packets. We can see the control flow control responder here sending out flow control packets to the crossbar. So it informs the upstream block via flow control pa packets of the fullness of its own of that block's FIFO. This forms sort of a loop where the upstream block will send data packets to the downstream block. And as that FIFO fills up, if it gets too full, it'll stop. The downstream FIFO as it, excuse me, the downstream block as it consumes packets from that data FIFO, data packet FIFO, will then sort of return credits to that upstream block, letting it know the FIFO is emptying. And it, and it forms sort of a, a loop here of, you know, the upstream block will, will send packets if there's room available or throttle if, if there's not. Flow control is necessary to prevent stalling in the crossbar and potentially causing a lockup. We could see that where if the upstream block sends a data packet to the FIFO, you know, to the block, the downstream block, and it, it overflows that FIFO, well, technically it won't really overflow it. Instead, it'll fill the FIFO. And because we're using Axis Stream, it'll block through that data uh, signal coming into the the FIFO up through the DMUX and then up into the crossbar, which is, it wouldn't be such a big deal, except that we also have potentially other packets that are trying to get into this block, such as command packets, uh, maybe flow control packets uh, from that block's downstream block. And so then you end up in this sort of deadlock situation where, you know, you, you can't get other packets in, or maybe the, the data packet can't, uh, clear the crossbar, and so you just end up in a deadlock. In the middle, we can see the command packet processor block. Now, as I said earlier, we have control, or sometimes you'll see them labeled as command. This, they're synonymous. Control or command packets coming into our block here, which are triggering settings bus writes or writing to user registers. You can see that command packet comes into the command processor and then it has an output here on this set underscore asterisk standing for this set re settings register bus. And you have the opposite, the readback bus coming in here to the, con the command packet processor, which triggers a response packet. So you can see that's that little loop there of, of using command slash control packets to write registers, and then the reading of registers or the readback comes through the response packets. Next, we have a set of useful signals. These are stream IDs. As I said earlier, you know, every, every block has a, a stream ID associated with it. That's like a network address that's set up by UHD, set up by software. So the first one is the source SID or source stream ID. That's the stream ID of this block. 
the next dest SID or next destination stream ID is the SID of the downstream block from this block, which not every block may have one. For instance, if you think of a flow graph where, say, you're using a, a transmit flow graph, for instance, and so the very last block would be, say, the radio core block that uh, then transmits samples. It's the last block in the chain or in the flow graph, and so it has no downstream block per se, and so the next S stream ID would not be used in that particular block. The value there wouldn't be meaningful. Next is the response in and response out destination stream IDs. These are kind of special. Uh, generally, they're only used in the radio block for that case I brought up earlier where if you have an overrun or another case would be an underrun of the buffers in that block, uh, the block can send a special error packet back to the host letting it know that that condition occurred. Well, how does that block know what the stream ID of the host is? Well, that's the response in and response out destination stream IDs. A couple more signals here. We have the Vita time signal. This is used for timed settings bus writes. Generally, no blocks use this except for the radio core block, which is, you know, this is a special block uh, created by Edis for interfacing with the RF front end. So generally you won't be using this signal. There's a better way if you want to do timed commands or timed settings bus writes, which you can look at the DDC and duck blocks for an example of how to do that. There's also this clear TX sequence num signal. This can be useful if you want your block to have a user logic reset that gets asserted every time the block is enumerated, say every time you start up your application. If you keep your, say, USRP just running constantly, but you want to have a, a reset every time you start your application, you could use the clear TX sequence num for that. So we've went over the internals of Knox Shell, and one of the things that we highlighted was it outputs the Cheddar data packets on an Axi stream. But as we know, Cheddar packets have a packet header, which is not too cumbersome to deal with. But the, one of the purposes of RFNOC is to really take care of things like that. You don't care about really the RFNOC infrastructure and the packetization generally. You just want a stream of samples coming in that you can manipulate. Well, that's where Axie Wrapper comes into play. It converts Cheddar data packets into a stream of samples on an AxiStream bus. It's really intended to simplify things for the user. So I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead a few slides here again. And we're going to take a look first at the Axie wrapper internals. We can see in the upper left that the Cheddar data packets from Knockshell go into the deframer, which removes the header and puts it into a FIFO. We can see there the header FIFO. On the bottom, we can see that samples from the user, that's the lower left here, sample data from user IP. Samples from the user go into the framer, which adds a header. So we can see the header FIFO or the user provided cheddar header here come into a MUX and then the output goes into the framer, which its output then goes to knock shell. The header comes from either the FIFO, the header FIFO, or from the user. And a parameter called simple mode controls that MUX. What is simple mode and, and why do we use it? Well, any block that produces as many samples as it consumes can use simple mode. For example, let's consider a block, say you're implementing an FFT block that's 512 points. 
It consumes 512 time domain samples and outputs 512 frequency domain values. Since your block produces as many values as it consumes, albeit with a delay, but still a one-to-one -one ratio, it can use simple mode. In contrast, imagine, say, a decimating filter. It decimates by two. Well, that block, obviously, it consumes 2x samples for every one sample that it outputs. In that case, it can't use simple mode because there's not a one-to-one -one ratio of input samples to output samples. Now, why do we need this one-to-one -one ratio? Well, the header FIFO here is the clue. For every incoming packet, we strip off the header and we put it in this FIFO. And then for every outgoing packet, if we're using simple mode, we put that header back on with uh, some slight modifications. One, we can see this next destination, which would be that next, next destination stream ID coming out of Noxshell, coming into the header FIFO here to replace the uh, next, the destination stream ID in the header packet. <clears throat> so we can see in this case that if we were having, say, in the decimating FIR filter case, we had 2x packets coming in for every one packet that comes out. That means we'd have twice as many headers going into the header FIFO than are being consumed or, or removed from the header FIFO, which would cause the header FIFO to overflow. And that's why simple mode requires this one-to-one -one ratio because otherwise the header FIFO will overflow or the opposite could happen where say you have an interpolating filter, interpolate by two, so for every one packet coming in, you're gonna output two packets worth of samples. Well, in that case, the header FIFO would underflow uh, because you'd only be putting in one header for every two headers that you take out. Simple mode is just really useful for those blocks that have that one-to-one -one ratio. You can just enable it and then not have to worry about the header ever again. Now, truth be told, what about the blocks that don't have that one-to-one -one ratio? Well, headers are actually not that hard to deal with. There are several examples on how to set them up. It's just that having this functionality is very convenient. Finally, XE Wrapper has another feature that's worth mentioning. It's the reset input and reset output block output excuse me, resize input and resize output blocks, which really this involves manipulating that TLAS signal I talked about earlier when it comes to AxiStream. It's just resizing the packet so the TLAS occurs at a different spot. One case maybe you might use this would be, say, uh, the FFT IP from Xilinx expects the TLAS signal to be at the end of an FFT frame. So if you have a 512 point FFT, every 512 time domain samples, it expects a TLAS to be exerted. So maybe you could use the uh, resize input feature of Axie Wrapper to ensure that every 512 samples, TLAS is indeed inserted or is asserted. So now let's take a look at the Axie Wrapper instantiation in our code, starting at line 101. We can see at the top there's that parameter simple mode that we went over. Next, we have connections that go to knock shell. And we also have the bus clock, CE clock, connections, a clear TX sequence num, next destination stream ID as I brought up just a few moments ago. And we have our input and output stream sync and stream source cheddar data actually stream interfaces. Now Axie Wrapper also outputs sample streams on the M axis as the output and S axis as the input for sample streams to and from the user. These streams generally are 32-bit wide, 
and typically use what is known as SC16, which stands for an, for a 32-bit wide sample. It's 16-bit I and 16-bit Q, and that means that the upper 16 bits are the real sample data and the lower 16 bits are the imaginary sample data. And of course, the TLAST signals indicate packet boundaries. Next, we have the T user signals. That's the packet headers that, for instance, the M axis data T user is the packet header for the cheddar data packet that came in to your block. It's just reflected on there in case you wanna, want to use it for some reason. You may if you're, say, manually forming your own packet headers. And S axis data T user, that's the packet, that's a signal that you'll provide your packet header to Axie Wrapper in the case that you can't use simple mode. Next, we have these sort of axis config signals. Those can be ignored. Those are legacy. And we have these axis packet length signals. This is for resizing the incoming packet length. Note that you need to use this interface, you need to make sure to enable resize input packet as a parameter into Axie Wrapper, otherwise they, they aren't used. So we've covered Knock Shell and Axie Wrapper and the associated Axie Stream buses. Now let's get into the real meat of our design, which is the user code and the user registers. What makes our design, our RFNOC block, unique to other RFNOC blocks? For the user code, there's many options that we can use to implement it. We can, of course, use HDL, Verilog, System Verilog, VHDL. They're all supported. You know, a question that often comes up is, you know, does RFNOC support Mixed HDL designs, sure, you can mix Verilog, System Verilog, and the HDL, no problem there. In some cases, perhaps you may have to wrap, you know, create a wrapper for your code. For instance, you may need to create a Verilog wrapper for your VHDL code, but that's it. We also support Ver Vivado IP, and there's many blocks that are available out there, and some of them that are as part of our design, you know, FFT is one I, I bring up where we use the Vivado FFT IP from Xilinx. Uh, another one is the FIR filter. You can see in places in our code where we use the Vivado IP for that. We also support Vivado block diagrams. One interesting use case would be a mic my MicroBlaze soft processor, MicroBlaze being a Xilinx soft processor IP that you could include via the block diagram approach in Vivado. We also support Vivado high-level synthesis, HLS. So you could use C or C++ code to implement your, your user code or your logic for your RFNOC block. And of course, we have user registers to support configuration control and read in a readback of the status of your block. Here's what our game block looks like when we include our user logic and user registers that we're going to be implementing shortly. We can see in the upper left here the command and response packets that that, that Axie Stream interface to knock shell. We're not using that. That's tip, typically most blocks don't use it, so I have it X'd out there. And then we can see that we have data packets coming from knock shell to go to Axie Wrapper. And out of Axie Wrapper, we have sample data coming into a multiplier, which we will multiply with a constant value that's set via a user register, user register address 128 for gain. And those are controlled via knock show over the settings bus, as explained earlier. And one thing you can see here I, I didn't show because we're, we don't show setting any cheddar packet headers or anything with Axie Wrapper because a simple gain block does have a one-to-one -one ratio for input and output samples. So we can use simple mode in Axie Wrapper and we don't have to you know, worry about any 
packet headers or anything like that. Okay, so back to the hands-on part. We're going to write our RF knock blocks Verilog code. And as I mentioned earlier, there is that RFNOC tutorial complete directory that contains a completed version of our block and all the associated code, so you can always go and double check your code if you make any mistakes. So here's our knock block game RF knock block. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a couple of signals, modify a couple of other signals. So first, let's start off with our SR test reg zero. This is a test register that was just set up automatically as part of the as part of the skeleton code. We're just going to change this to SR gain. And we're going to leave the SR user reg base for its address, which if we go here, we can see that's 128. Or if we really want to, we could set 128 as well. Either, either is fine. Next, we're going to change test reg zero. That's our user test register zero. We're going to change that to gain, and we're going to set it to 15, or 16 bits wide. That means we need to go down here to this width and set it to 16. And for the output, we need to set that to gain. So that means that this settings register at address SR test red zero, well, that's not right. We need to set that to SR gain. So at address SR gain, which is 128. Whenever we write to that particular address on the settings register bus, which is here the set strobe set adder set data coming out of knock shell, it will in fact put that value from S or set data onto this gain bus. And since this is a register, it'll with, it will retain that value. And so when we set gain, it'll be set on the gain signal and retained. Next, we go down here to our readback register section. If we're going to set a gain register, it would be nice to be able to read that value back if we want to. So what we'll do is we'll set this address 0. We see readback adder 0 here. We'll set that to our gain register. Now these are 64, readback data 64 bits wide. So since gain is 16 bits, we'll just prepend it with 48 zeros. Next, we can look down here and see that as part of our skeleton code, it was just a simple loop back. As the samples come in, they're just kind of come back out without any modifications. Well, since we're implementing gain here, we need to make a modification to these samples. We need to multiply them by our gain signal. So that's pretty simple. We'll go ahead and create what I'll call IQ signals. And then after I multiply those IQ signals by a gain, I'll put that value on these signals called IMult gain and QMult gain. So first, I is equal to the M axis data, T data, upper 16 bits which, as we said before, was I slash the real sample data. I'll go ahead and copy this, and we'll do the same thing for Q, which is the lower 16 bits, and that's the Q or imaginary sample data. 
Next, let's do our multiplication. And then finally, right here is the data, the sample loop back here. Let's go ahead and change that to our I malt gain 15 down to zero and Q malt gain 15 down to zero. Now what's happening here? This is interesting. We have a 16 bit sample, well, technically 32 bit complex sample, 16 bit real, 16 bit imaginary coming in and being multiplied by a gain. Now, two 16-bit values that are multiplied by each other will result in a 32-bit value. I malt gain here and Q malt gain here. But we're only taking lower 16 bits. So what that tells us is in certain circumstances, if our gain is too large, our signal is too large, some combination of those two, we could have overflow that could occur. In this case, we're not going to do anything about it. We'll just accept that overflow could happen. But, you know, proper design practices would be perhaps clipping the signal. So if it gets out of range, um, you clip at the most positive value. But we're not going to handle that in this case. Okay, so we finished writing our, co our core logic. But proper design when it comes to writing FPGA code is to also create a test bench to exercise our logic and make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Fortunately, RF knock has a fairly sophisticated test bench infrastructure that allows us to easily test our block. Essentially, what it does is it creates a pseudo USRP FPGA infrastructure where you have a crossbar and it can connect RF knock blocks, including the RF knock block that you're designing up to this crossbar. And then it connects another RF knock block called knock block TV, standing for test bench, which is a dummy block to allow us to communicate to our design under test RF knock block, our, our one that we're building ourselves through the test bench via and what's called an RFNOC Simlib API. So what's really powerful about this is it's fairly realistic to what's actually going on in the USRP itself, while also presenting a simple API to interact with your blocks. And the fact that you can instantiate other RFNOC blocks in this test bench can be really powerful. One could think about, you know, if I'm creating a sophisticated say modem and I have several blocks that I know already work what's really nice is to be able to do perhaps an end-to-end -end test where I could instantiate those RF knock blocks and then throw in my my particular block I'm testing and run the the whole design the whole modem end-to-end -end with say binary data coming in and binary data coming out the RF knock test bench infrastructure can allow you to do that by instantiating those RF knock blocks and your RF knock block that you're testing all at the same time. So this is what, from a block diagram perspective, our design looks like right now. We're just going to test our gain block. So that's what will be connected to the crossbar along with, as I said, the knock block TV block. That's that dummy block that allows us to communicate with our block uh, via the RF knock sim lib, lib and through the crossbar. You know, basically the, the nice thing about this is we're treating our RF knock block as if it was really in the USRP itself, in the FPGA. What we need to do is fill out our test bench. So first, before we do that, let's go ahead and do a test and, and see what happens if we just run our test bench. And let's go ahead and open up a new terminal window here. <clears throat> 
and I will go back to the home directory. So I go into RF knock workshop. Remember, I have to now source that environmental setup env.sh file. If I didn't, then, then I'd run into errors in the commands that I would, I'm going to be running next. Next, I'll go into the source and then RF knock tutorial directory. Those that are less familiar with CMake, generally what you do is you make a build directory. And then you go into that build directory and you run cmake dot dot forward slash, which will then set up the make files for your build. Next, we run make test tb, which sets up our test bench. And now we can run our make knock block gain tb target. We go ahead and run it. And in this case, what will happen is that Vovato is not set up in our virtual machine here. So at this point would be a good time that if you want to be able to run this test bench, you need to go ahead and install Vovato into it. Unfortunately, with the VM, we cannot release Vovato as that's Xilinx's program. So you'll want to take the steps to go ahead and, and install Vovato into this VM. Now, the nice part about our RFNOC test bench infrastructure is that you can use the Webpack version of Vovato, the Webpack license. You don't have to buy a license. You can just use the free version. And so I'm going to go ahead and set that up now, and then we'll rerun this command. Okay, we're back, and Vovato 2017.4 has been set up in the VM, so we should be able to run our test bench without getting an error that Vovato is not installed. So as you can see, Vovato has been found. 2017.4 is in the op directory. This is the typical process where it adds various Verilog files and other files needed to run the test bench. And then you can see that we end up with various errors. This one in particular, SR test red zero is not declared under prefix knock block gain. Now, if you remember from earlier, we actually changed SR test reg zero to SR gain. So that register doesn't even exist anymore. It makes sense that our test bench aired out. So what we need to do now is to go and update the test bench and add some code to actually exercise our RF knock block. Let's go ahead and open our RF knock block test bench. That is in the test benches directory, then knock block gain TB. This is the full path right here. Now, if you remember from earlier, some of these files right here were not in the directory. It was only the cmakelist.txt, the make file, and the knock block gain system verilog file here. These files were created when we ran the simulation. These are created by Vovato. Let's open up our test bench. Okay, so this is the test bench. Just going through it really quickly. In the top here is where it begins. We have a macro here. This is part of that sim RF knock lib API. You can see it's actually included right here. And we also have a couple other include files that set up some other useful macros. In this case, actually, I believe that the test bench init macro is, uh, I think it's actually in our system exec report header file. 
So this right here, this macro is saying, okay, we're setting up a test bench called knock block gain, number of tests, five nanoseconds per simulator tick, one. Then we have a couple of local parameters here to set up some useful settings in our test bench. We have bus clock period, CE clock period. Generally these are, you know, they're up to you as to what you want to set them by default. They're set up for the X310 values for CE clock and bus clock, but you could adjust these depending on the device or if you want to try out different scenarios. You know, as I said before, CE clock could be faster than bus clock or it could be slower. So this could be a, a way that you could modify that clock to see how does that affect your block relative to the, the bus, bus clock clock rate. NumCE also stands for the number of RF knock blocks. Sometimes you'll see computation engines used interchangeably for RF knock block. We're going more towards using RF knock block as the terminology, but the computation engine is, is sort of sprinkled throughout a lot of the RF knock code. So keep that in mind. In this case, we're only testing our gain block. So we're, we only have one CE or RF knock block to test. Number of streams. So I won't get too deeply into this concept, but as an overview, each RF knock block, as I said earlier when we were talking about the stream IDs, technically has four bits in the stream ID that are dedicated to what are known as logical or, or virtual ports. Four bits means that you can have 16 virtual ports inside of your RF knock block, which means you could have up to 16 streams coming into your block, independent streams. Some blocks may use more than one stream. For instance, the DDC and the duck blocks, the digital down converter, digital up converter blocks, they use multiple streams because say the radio core outputs multiple streams. And so having them go into the DDC or the duck together is a useful uh, situation. This is more of a design choice. In our case, in our simple game block, we're only using one stream. I would say the majority of blocks also tend to only use one stream. And, and if you use more than that, it's, it's more of an advanced topic. Now we have RF knock sim in it, RF knock add block. These macros are certainly defined here in the sim RF knock lib if you want to look at the code behind them. So this one says, okay, we're going to set up an RF knock simulation with a num CE, which is one, num streams, one, bus clock period, CE clock period. And then we're going to add our block, knock block gain. And this number right here is actually the port on the crossbar that we're going to connect it to. Uh, so if you had multiple blocks that you're adding in case, so say you wanted to test, I will just, I keep using the FFT example, so let's just do that for fun. Say we do the FFT. Well, first of all, we'd have to change numce to 2, and then we would increment this to 1. And now you have both of those blocks in your test bench. Simple as that. But I will revert to where we were. We're only going to look at the gain block. SPP equals 16. This is samples per packet. This is the size of the packet, the you know, number of samples that you're going to have in a packet. 16 is a very small value that makes for small packets, but Occasionally you'll see that because that's just a useful default value. You could increase it, you know, 256, uh, 512, larger values. There is an upper limit, though. This value actually comes into play earlier when we talked about the, the stream uh, sync FIFO size, that parameter uh, at the top level of your block. In that case, that, that parameter is, is related to this SPP. And that's why probably keeping it at a default value of, say, 16 or or so is a good choice for your test bench just so there's automatic compatibility there and you don't have to adjust any other parameters. Next we get into the heart of our code in here. Now we have various tests here that are uh, delimited by a test case start, test case done. So there's a reset. There's a checking the knock ID. You know, these are all skeleton. This is a skeleton file. These are all automatically included by our knock mod tool. Here we connect the blocks. So our knock connect. 
Then we go into this test, which is to write and read user registers. Now this is the first place that we'll make an edit. So we have this TB streamer. It's a sort of a system Verilog object that is just our part of our RFNOC test bench API to allow us to communicate with our RFNOC block under test or technically even other RFNOC blocks. And you have other RFNOC blocks that you can talk to because this first parameter here is actually the SID for the block that you want to communicate with. This S SID underscore knock block game is set up automatically by this RFNOC add block macro. So if we say had that earlier, we had the adding of the FFT block. In that case, we'd also have, say, SID knock block FFT we could use. So in this case, we only have the game block. This is the address of the register that we want to write to, you know, write user reg here. So we don't have a test reg zero. We have SR game. We're using a hierarchical reference here, by the way, to knock, knock block gain dot SR gain. So we don't have to actually put 128 here. We can just reference to it. Then random word, you know, just a random value to test it. And then we do a read back here. Notice right here that this is zero. That is the readback address, which earlier uh, we set as zero. In this case, we, we could have made a local parameter. So this was parameterized, but we didn't. We left it just as it, as it is. And then here, we're just setting up an assertion to check it. Now, the, our error from earlier, I believe, was, was related to this line because we were trying to access earlier a register referent, uh, this hierarchical reference was trying to access something that didn't exist. Then next, this is gonna read back register two. We didn't make any changes, or excuse me, reg, user register one, the second register in our design. We didn't make any changes to that code, so this will just work out of the box. Next, we have our test sequence. So in the skeleton code with our, our game block before we made any edits, it was just a simple loop back. And so this test sequence is, is testing that. We send a ramp of values. This is just a counter that ramps. And then we check that it's correct. It's the same values that we get back. Nothing, nothing too exciting here. What we are going to do is update this to do a uh, to actually test out the game now i'm going to actually go back up here because there was something i skipped so for our sr gain if we remember earlier it's only 16 bits wide so we're only going to use 16 bits from the random word here and then on our readback values we're just going to change this to only look at 16 bits. So I want to make sure I get that updated before we move on and uh, forget about it. So down here in this test sequence, as I said, we're, we're going to try to test changing the gain and seeing if it works. So we need to add a gain variable. We'll just put this at the top. Short int gain, so 16-bit gain value. We'll go down here and set that gain to 100. Or we could use a random value. Uh, this, this test bench is not going to be the most thorough. It's just an example. We can go ahead and copy this line here to write the gain register. So that's a nice little shortcut there. And then we will go right here. And instead of writing a ramp of values, which if you look right here, I is the index of the for loop here. 
And so, you know, we're extending this to 64 bits. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this a little bit more thorough. In our design, we are multiplying I and Q by the gain value. So let's, let's try to make this a little bit more thorough. That 64-bit value is two samples. And so in this case, we're going to send two samples at a time, but both the real, which is the upper bits, upper 16 bits, and the imaginary lower bits are actually set to a value. Before 64, the, the index extended to 64 bits, that meant that not every time were you exercising all of the, the samples, all of the real and imaginary components of those samples, that this will make sure that we exercise them all together. Next, down here in expected value, we are just looking to make sure that it matches the index of the loop. And we are going to update that to actually be the gain multiplied by that particular sample value that's expected. So, pretty, pretty straightforward. Essentially what we're doing is we're sending two complex samples, and then we're testing if they were multiplied individually by the gain. And the gain is the same for both the real and imaginary parts, so there's a lot of symmetry here. And again, this isn't the most thorough test bench. Ideally, you'd want to randomize the gain. You probably wouldn't want these to be the same index value. You'd want to use something a little bit better, a little bit different. Uh, in fact, you know, for fun, we could go ahead and just do that right now. Let's just add a, a plus. Actually, let's, let's go even further. Let's say we add a plus one, a plus two, a plus we'll add a 10 and 11. We'll, we'll make sure that we're not, we at least don't overlap, which this is different. That's what then in the slides, but you know, we can have a little bit of fun here doing it ad hoc. So this is a little bit more thorough, not, not, not too much more, but enough to show that we, that we don't have some, you know, say repeat values that we're thinking are actually correct when they're not. Okay, so we've updated our test bench. Let's go back to the command line And let's go ahead and run our make knock block gain TB, uh, run our test bench again. And if, if you, you lost the terminal window, remember you have to go source the setup in file before you run this. Okay, so we'll run this. And hopefully it passes. Oh, it, it didn't pass. So looks like we're going to do some on the fly here editing. Let's see what happened. It says here, syntax error near a comma, line 112. So let's go there and see at line 112 what happened. Line 112. And it looks like I had an extra parentheses right there. Whoops. So let's save that and try again. This shows one of the nice things about doing a test bench and why it's useful. Here shortly, we're going to talk about building a bitstream, which takes a really long time. 
in some cases, it could take hours. And so th this shows how much more quickly you can catch errors without having to wait. Now we can see right here that it's passed. Let's look at the output here. Right here I highlighted. Okay, so this was the first test case. One, wait for recess, reset. It passed. Here's the second one checking the knock ID. There's our knock ID. It passed. Here we're setting RF knock block or connecting the RF knock blocks. There's our stream IDs. So we're connecting our knock block TB, if you remember earlier from the block diagram, to gain and then gain back to knock block TB. Then we're writing user registers that passed, our test sequence passed because we are you know, sending our sample stream in, multiplying by the gain value and doing an assertion. And if, any, and if the assertion failed, then this would actually say it failed. Let's go ahead and trigger that real fast just to make sure that I'm being truthful. So we'll run it again and I expect that test case five will fail. Oops, there we go. We're getting some errors here. Only four tests passed, result failed. All right, so let's change it back so we're correct again. And uh, yeah, so it does look like our test bench is working. It's actually doing something. It is exercising our block, albeit somewhat minimally, but this is a simple block. So now that we have set up our test bench and ran it, the next logical step is to generate a bit stream. To do so, we run a tool known as UHD Image Builder. Specifically, I like to run the GUI version called UHD Image, UHD Image Builder GUI.py. It is a Python. Python script file. It's located in our UHD FPGA source directory. So let's go ahead and go there and open it up and we'll step through it. That error actually came from, uh, that popped up there, came from Vivado. So I guess it behind the scenes triggered some sort of error. You know, just as a quick side note, the Vivado XN error is free, but unfortunately has bugs occasionally. We're using 2017.4 in this case. Uh, the newer versions of Vivado have you know bug fixes. So in this case, it looks like it triggered a, a bug and, and uh, we got a little bit of a, a bug report that popped up there. So you know don't don't worry about that. That that does happen occasionally. That's that's not an RF knock issue. That's more of a, a Vivado issue which people that do a lot of FPGA design <laughs> might be somewhat familiar with. So let's go ahead and open up, like I said, UHD image builder GUI. So I went to RF knock workshop source. I'm keeping the same terminal window so I don't have to run setup in, source setup in .sh again. It's in the UHD FPGA directory. Then we go to usurp three. Tools, scripts, and then here is the GUI. Now, the way the GUI works is it actually calls this script. It just sets up the parameters for calling this script for us. It's just a nice and convenient thing to use. But if you have, say, a, a build system where you want to automate this and you're not going to be using the GUI or anything like that, uh, you'll see shortly that it actually shows you what, what you need to call this script with, what, what parameters and arguments you need to call it with. Okay, so here is UHD image builder.py GUI. Here on the left, we can see that we have a bunch of build targets. 
depending on what version of UHD you have, well, this list will change over time as new devices are released. You can see here that these are all the third generation devices. You have the X300 series. You have the E300, N3, N310, N300. In our case, we're targeting the X310 RF knock HG. You also have different targets here, HG, XG. HG stands for an image that's called a hybrid image. It has a 10 gig E port and a 1 gig E port. XG would be two 10 gig E ports. Uh, and then the other ones, you know, the, for instance, the E310, you have the older version of the E310 that was a speed grade one device for the Zinc FPGA. Then the, the one that's sold now, um, pretty much everybody has is the speed grade three device. So you choose the SG3 option. And then for the N300 series, there, there's a lot of different options here. So you'd want to look in the manual to see which one you might want. But we're selecting the X310 RF knock HG image. You can see on the bottom, as I said here, if we just selected this and, it, and ran it, th this is what you'd run in the, the terminal. It's not really doing anything yet, yet because we haven't selected any blocks to add. And the number of blocks that we can add to our design here is 10. This value does change depending on the device. So we have our Edis provided blocks right here. So you have you know, your FFT, your DDC, your DUC, it's just, just a various number of blocks in here. I will say, just to let you know, that the replay block, while listed, you do not want to add it because this is sort of a special block. Uh, the block like the file source, file I.O., you wouldn't want to add those either. Those are or export I.O. These are all sort of special blocks. They're listed. Maybe we could come up with a special case to use them, but generally you, you wouldn't use these because especially these uh, three are not synthesizable blocks. So the DDC and the duck are important blocks because our X310 device uses these to do sample rate conversion. So generally you'll add these blocks. Let's just go ahead and add them. And then you can see they populate over here. And then in our case, we want to be able to run our out of, our, our out of tree block, our RF knock block that we've created. So here's the add OOT blocks button. And what you're going to do you can see it's RFNOC, RFNOC Workshop Source Directory. What you want to do is go into RFNOC Tutorial and then just click Open. And what will happen is our game block will be populated here. So then we can add our game block. And now we have a bit more interesting UHD image builder command here that includes our DDC, our duck, our gain, our target. We've got X310. And we're including an OOT directory right here. And then we have a couple other buttons before I click this generate bit file. You can see that we're only using three out of 10 of the blocks. Say you want to fill up the rest of the design with FIFO, some designs, especially when you're doing bit stream or debugging with, with uh, your bitstream and various configurations. Sometimes it's useful actually to have these FIFOs. So there's an option here just to fill the rest of the design with FIFOs. These, these are FIFO blocks. It's this Axie FIFO loopback. So clicking this would be the equivalent in this case of adding seven of these blocks. Next, you can open the Vlado GUI. Well, this is really nice. So if you, uh, if you want to use the GUI, uh, if you want to save a project file and just use the GUI from now on, you could click on this and it'll pull up the GUI. Clean IP. So when you do a build, it's going to generate a lot of IP. Sometimes what happens when you're upgrading between FPGA versions, uh, you know, other releases of UHD use more modern versions of Vivado. And when you go between the different versions, the IP changes, sometimes that can cause errors. So this clean IP button is nice because you can click it and run it once and it'll just delete and clear out all the IP and rebuild to deal with those errors. There's also this import from GRC button. What's pretty neat about this 
is if you already have a GNU radio flow graph, which we'll see later an example of, or, or actually you saw earlier in part one, let, let, me, let me say that, of flow graphs with you know, RF knock blocks in it. And say you want to build an image with those blocks in it, you could just open the GRC file with this import from GRC, and then it'll populate this blocks and current design on the side with, with all the blocks that are, that are in that flow graph. So that's real convenient. And then finally, you click here to generate the bit file. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just click it, just so you see here. And you can see it's already starting to try to build this IP. I expect this to fail because I'm only using the Webpack license. And we're trying to build for the X310, which requires a, uh, a full Vivado license. In fact, you can see it right here. A valid license was not found for synthesis. So you would need a full Vivado license to build for the X310. Now, that's different for the E310, for instance. That one, the, the device in the E310, is a smaller size zinc device that works with the free Webpack license. So you could actually run and build that design. So in our case, let's say even if we did have the full license, we don't want to sit here and, and wait you know, for an hour or more waiting for this build to complete. So let's close out of Image Builder here and go back a couple of directories. If we go to our RFNOC workshop directory, you'll see, oh, excuse me, go up to the source directory. RFNOC workshop source, you will see that we have this USRP X310 FPJ RFNOC HG 1.bit, and there's a 2 version of this well. So this one right here has all the RFNOC blocks that you saw in the part 1 demos, including the FFT, the FIR filter, uh, Phosphor, for instance. Those are all built into that bit stream. Uh, for part this second one, this includes our gain block pre-built in here. And so the nice part is you can load up this bitstream on your device using UHD image loader, which I will show later how to do that. And then you can just run it and you don't have to build your own image. So that, that's the thing about this VM is it's meant to be sort of self-contained. Okay, so now we know how to build our bitstream. We could have built our bitstream. We already have pre-made images that we can use. So that concludes our FPGA portion of the design. It's really that simple. So next, we go to the software portion that involves UHD. How do we add our RFNOC block to UHD such that it's aware of it, aware of its capabilities, and allows us to do things like set the game from software? Well, the first step is we start with the block controller, which is written in C++. The block controller tells UHD about the block and exposes methods to access and control it. For example, the FIR filter block that we've seen before, if you look into its C++ code, it has a method called set taps. It reads in a vector of taps and then will issue writes to a user register that allows you to set the taps for the FIR filter. Now, many blocks only need to read and write registers. In fact, in my experience, I'd say 99% of the blocks are like that, where they're, they're usually simple cases of reading, and generally not even reading, but often just writing registers to set up the block, and then it runs. And maybe you write the registers again during runtime to change modes or, or update taps or something like that. 
that situation is simple enough and common enough that we actually have included as part of the default default block controller class a means to to handle that case and since it's in the default block controller class that means that you don't need to do any sort of custom implementation you don't need to change the default block controller class you can just use it as is and so that removes the need to write any C++ code in that simple case. And so if we were to go into our tutorial, our out of free rfnoc tutorial directory, look at the gain block control impl.ccp file, we would see that's a default block, it uses the default block controller, and we don't need to change anything because we're just gonna write the gain register. This is nice because it means many, many blocks out there, you don't have to touch any C++ code when it comes to integrating with C++. So that part is, is done already. Instead, what you can do is set up the Knock script XML. Now the Knock script XML describes our block to UHE. Technically, what you do with Knock script, you can do in C++. But remember, just, just now I said that we're not going to write any C++ code because the block controller has, by default, everything we need, the default block controller. So we still need a way to describe what is our block's knock ID, what are the register addresses. And that's where knock script comes in. It's an XML-based domain-specific language for block configuration. The nice part is it requires no recompilation of UHD. You can update it between runs of your application if you make a mistake. It describes the knock ID, user registers, number of input output ports. If you think input output ports, that's that logical slash virtual ports concept I've talked about. You can create what we call args, which is customizing how you write to re user registers. The concept of args is that it's a statically typed quasi-functional uh, command, really. And it supports basic types of integers, strings, doubles. You can do basic arithmetic and logic operations. And there is some syntax included to allow you to validate that your input is correct you know, within a range, or if it's a Boolean value, is it you know, zero or one. And so that's all included in the Knock script XML. And RFNOC mod tool, as we've seen here before, that it, it generates the skeleton files for everything we need for our RFNOC tool, our RFNOC block. And we have a skeleton file for Knock script as well. So let's go ahead and edit that file going back into our RFNOC tutorial directory. We can go into the RFNOC and then blocks directory. We can see there's a gain.xml. We'll open that up. So this file is pretty succinct. We have the name of our block, our block name, both gain. We have our ID, which stands for our knock block ID. Right here, it's already been filled for us. We don't have to do anything. So what we're going to add is two more sections. The first one is registers. And we're going to do set reg, which means we're going to write reg, write to the register or set the register. This is our settings register or user register called gain at address 128. And we only have one register, user register that we're looking at. So that's it. If you had more, of course you could, you know, if we wanted to call or we want to add another register here, we'll say gain two, then it's as simple as that. 
Next, we add a section for args. And we're going to add an argument called gain, which is double as its type, double precision floating point. By default, we'll set its value to 1. We'll add a check here for greater than or equal to the gain so we can self-reference ourselves. We'll say, is the gain value greater than or equal to 0, 0.0 or less than or equal to Thirty-two seven sixty-seven dot zero, which is two to the six. Excuse me, two to the fifteenth minus one. So there's that checking syntax. And if we make a mistake, we want it to tell us what was the mistake. So there's our check message. And then what do we do with this arg? What's its action? Well, generally we only support writing registers. So we have a call called srwrite, or a function here, srwrite. We'll write to the gain register. That's referring to here, right here. This is a reference back to the gain register. Then we're going to do an integer round of the gain And that is it. What we're seeing here, though, is that our gain value is 16 bits. We're going to enforce it into, you know, it could be a, interpreted as a signed value. So we're going to enforce it here between 0 and 32767. That means the double precision value coming in is, is expected to be in this range here. You know, one neat thing that could have been done here is instead normalize the gain based on between 0 and 1 and then divide, say, here in the action, or not divide, multiply here in the action that value between 0 and 1 to get the actual integer value that we'd want to send. That's a possibility. We, we didn't do that in this particular example, but it can be done. Okay, so that is the knock script. Let's go back to our block diagram and see how does knock script apply to this block diagram. So first we have the knock ID right here. Next we have the knock shell and there was a port section, input and output. So this would be the case where if you had multiple virtual ports, you could name out these different sinks and sources. Each one would just have a different name. You'll see like on the DDC block for the two input and output ports it has, one's called N0, out0, and then another one's called N1, out1. Then we have our register gain here with address 128. And then arg doesn't quite map to the block diagram, so we don't have anything for that. So that's all you need to do for the UHD software support. You're done. Most blocks, you just go in and you write the Knox script XML, lay out which registers you're going to be writing to, set up some args to write to them, and that's it. So the next step would be GNU Radio integration, which necessarily you may not do. If you're just going to use UHD and C, you know, as a C++ app, and that's it, then you wouldn't go to this next step with GNU Radio. You'd be done. But in our case, we're going to show off the GNU Radio integration.
and show how to do that. So with GNU Radio, they have block code written in Python or C++ for all the blocks. And what's interesting is this concept of this default block controller that handles what we need to do by default generally with UHD. This concept we've also embraced when it comes to the GNU Radio block code. So in our case, there's another out of tree module called GREdits that was installed that I didn't go over, but this is the infrastructure code in C++ that allows RF knock support in GNU Radio. And GREdits provides a base RF knock block class. And you could extend that class and, and customize it for your block if you have special, special use cases. In our case, we're just writing a register, and that block class supports it out of the box. And most blocks can do that, just, just use it as is. And so when it comes to the GNU Radio block code, we don't need to write any C++ or Python. We're done, just like with UHD. We do, though, need to let GNU Radio Companion know about our block, and of course, with GR mod tool, it generated a skeleton file for us. With GNU Radio Companion XML files, what they're doing is they're describing the block to GNU Radio Companion. Similarly to UHD, how our knock script is describing it to UHD, uh, GNU Radio Companion needs to know what, what are the parameters of the block, what are its inputs and outputs. This is a requirement of, of GNU Radio Companion, not necessarily GNU Radio itself. Most people use GNU Radio Companion, so in general, I, you'll, you'll be implementing this, this particular XML. There are, uh, there's a tutorial GNU Radio provides explaining these uh, GNU Radio Companion XML files more in depth. And this is GNU Radio 3.7, by the way. GNU Radio 3.8. A and later, they have a different format. So I'm just talking about GNU Radio 3.7 and its XML format. Uh, you can go to the GNU Radio.org website and get tutorials or look at tutorials on, on how to set up these files. I'll just give a sort of brief overview of the changes that we need to make. So let's open up our tutorial underscore gain.xml GRC XML file. So let's go back to the root directory of RFNOC tutorial. We'll go into GRC. There's our tutorial gain.xml file. This is already set up to use that default block controller class with some code right here to interact with it. Now in our case, we just want to set the gain register. And if you remember, we set up an arg to allow us to do that. Well, there is a function as part of that default block class called set underscore arg. And that will allow us to set a register by name. And I think this is clear or more clear if we add some code to do that. So, we'll add the cell, this, this call here, that function. And so you can see we're setting our gain, which if we go ahead and just open up our knock script file here, Here's that R gain. And we're just going to set it by this gain value reference. Well, what is that? That is going to be a parameter that we set up called gain. 
And also, we want to be able to update this parameter at runtime. So we're going to set up a callback here that allows us to update this at runtime. And that's it. We're done. Okay, so we have now completed every step for our RFNOC block. We've, in the FPGA, implemented our Verilog code in a test bench. UHD, we set up our NOC script XML. We did not need to set up a block controller because our block was that simple. It only writes registers. The same applies to the radio for their block code. We didn't need to set up any code there because the default block class, RFNOC block class, that is added to the GUNA radio through the GR Edis outer tree module allows us to write registers without writing any additional code and we just needed to set up the GRC bindings in XML. Now that we've done all of this, we'll want to install our RFNOC block. So we would go to build and again, make sure to source the setup underscore m.sh file before running this step. In this case, it's going to make sure that the appropriate libraries for UHD and GNU Radio are found. Otherwise, you, you may run into, and almost certainly you'll run into a build error. So let's run make install. And it runs through, you know, build here. Since we didn't Oh, well, you can see that it, it didn't find uh, it didn't find GNU Radio. It looks like so. Let's uh, let's make sure that we sourced our our environmental file there. Try again. Oh, there you go. Now it's installing. So you can see that's what happens if you don't source that file. Sometimes you run into you know error there where it, it couldn't find GNU Radio. Now everything's been installed. And we want to program the bitstream to our device, our X310. And so this is where we would, we could do two options here on how to program the bitstream. One is the viv JTAG program approach. So what you do is you would go into the UHD FPGA source, go all the way through USERP3, top, X300, and then source the setup end.sh file. That will allow you to access the vidjtag program file or program script, really, uh, at, on, the com on the command line. And then you could program this bitstream now, one thing is that this is programming over JTAG, and so this bitstream will not be there if you, say, uh, power cycle the device. It's not retained. Another option is to use UHD image loader. One nice thing about UHD image loader is you don't need Vivado installed. And in this VM, if you don't have your USB settings set up properly, uh, JTAG, the Viv JTAG program command may not work. Now, in my case, I've already loaded this onto my X310, but I will show what you need to do to load it yourself. So, this is the program. UHD image loader, again, you need to source the setup underscore m.sh file to have access to it. And what you do to load your image is you'll run UHD image loader, then the args argument or option, you'll set type equals x300. 
then FPGA path and we would type that right there. And that will load your image to your USRP. Of course, it needs to be turned on, needs to be connected. Uh, you need to make sure for this VM in particular that you have the network set up on bridge mode and you can see your device through the network. In my case, I'll go over those settings just real fast. I have, I'm running this uh, in VirtualBox, and so I've set up the network in bridged mode. And then if we look at my connections here, in my case, I'm actually running over 10 giggy to my extra 10. By default, its address is 192.168.40.1. My host IP is a different address, and then I set the address of my VM here, set it to manual, manual and set the address to 40.7. And we can see here that I can actually ping my device. I think it's dot two, yeah, by default. So there it is. And if you have trouble, by the way, running UHD Image Loader, just, just to backpedal just a little bit, there is information on how to run that in the manual as well, in the uh, UHD manual, that is. Okay, so let's test in hardware. Let's open up GNU Radio and run our flow graph. Now, I could set up this flow graph from scratch, but it takes a while and so I'm going to go ahead and open up the completed flow graph in our RF knock tutorial complete directory to save time. So let's do GNU do Radio Companion here, run this command, which pulls up GNU Radio Companion. We'll open in RF knock tutorial complete, go to examples, right here, the game. Example. Now here's something that's interesting. If you made a mistake in setting up your design or installing your design, this block, RF not gain, will not be prop like populated correctly. It'll it'll likely say missing block and be like a red box. And you may get like an, an error here in the console. So that's one thing to watch out for. If you made that mistake, it's not working for you, and you really don't want to go back and fix it, another option is you can go to RFNOC Tutorial Complete. If you look in here, you'll see there's a build directory right there. If not, just create the build directory and run cmake dot dot forward slash. And of course, as always, source the setup in underscore in dot sh file before doing this. And then you can just run here make install, if I could spell. And the nice thing about this is it'll install the files. These are all correctly written. And so sure you went to the tutorial or the, well, the workshop here and you made some mistakes, but that's fine. All the correct files are already here for you to use. In my case, it looks like I didn't make a mistake, but we'll see. I'm going to try to run it. Maybe I made a typo somewhere. It's possible. So let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. It looks like we're running okay. Ah, well, it looks like it, it didn't work. So it looks like I may have made a, uh, maybe a mistake somewhere. Let's just make sure. I'm going to go ahead and open up here and do and just make sure that we actually have the right bitstream loaded. So we will run UHD user probe. And we have a block zero here. This is interesting. Now, 
what that is telling, because it's telling us the RF knock blocks in the device. Block zero means that our block uh, didn't have any knock script found for it. So did I mistype maybe the knock ID? Well, as I said before, what you can always do is run RF knock tutorial complete, go to the build directory. Of course, make sure to source the setup in file and do a make install. And then we'll run that command again and see if all of a sudden it works. And while that's installing, maybe we'll just take a quick look and see if we can see if our, oh, there it is, E7757. E572. But well that's for the DSP tune. So actually here is one. So that, that was a different block. So here our block zero. It looks like they couldn't find a block controller for that particular one. So it looks like perhaps we made a mistake in our XML. So we've reinstalled this right here. We've installed our RFNOC tutorial complete. Let's run UHD user probe and see what happens. Ah, there it is, the gain block. So now we should be able to run our flow graph. And here it goes, it runs. So. There you go. There's a nice example where if you make any mistakes, like me, for instance, you can just install from the RF Knock Tutorial Complete directory and you'll be good to go. So here's our gain example. We can adjust the frequency back and forth. Let's go ahead and pull this close to DC so we can see our sine wave here. Now we can adjust our sine wave amplitude. We'll, we'll make sure one and negative one here is visible. And we can increase our amplitude all the way up to near one, you know, all the way down to zero. Now, remember in our case that our gain we're taking the lower fifth or 16 bits here. So let's see what happens when we hit two. So it increases it by two. Now remember we're 0.33, so multiplying by two was now 0.66. By three, it's now 0.33, or excuse me, 0.993. And if we do one more, it, it goes and gives us a crazy looking output. When you look closely, it's actually due to overflowing or arithmetic wraparound here. So you can see that th this is a very typical look here. We have this sort of, where the, the sine wave sort of folds in on itself. And that's because we're outside of our range. And as soon as we say, reduce the amplitude, you can see it works again. So one option here, as I said earlier, would be to clip at the maximum value. So when you got near to one, it would just hold and, and clip at that value and not allow that wraparound. We didn't, we didn't add it. Maybe that's a nice exercise to try for yourself to see if you can get that to work. Now, the neat thing about this right here is it's running in the FPGA. If we look at our flow graph, we are creating our signal on Guinea Radio going 
into RFNOC and their FPGA, our FPGA device, going through the FIFO block and the game block, and then coming back and plotting. This really shows the power of combining RFNOC with GNU Radio. You know, we're using just a basic signal source, but we have this whole list of blocks that we could try to create our own flow graph, something much more complicated than this, and, and test out with our block. It really is a powerful approach. One thing to notice here is I do have this FIFO plus gain combination. Now, why do I have the FIFO block there? One limitation of RFNOC 3 is in GNU Radio, you cannot have a flow graph with just one RFNOC block if you're doing something like a host RFNOC to host transition. So if we just got rid of this FIFO block here, say we just you know got rid of it, we disabled it, and did this, the flow graph would still run, but the performance would be terrible. The problem is that here we have a TX and RX thread that are you know, receiving data in, in, from you know, in the host and sending it to the FPGA and all, is also receiving data from the FPGA and transitioning it over to the host to send it to the next block. Those two threads fight each other in the single block and uh, end up causing poor performance when you have, or th those two, excuse me, not threads, but functions fight each other within the one thread that's for this RF not game block. And so if you break up the receive and transmit functions into two blocks, which will be their own threads, you won't have that sort of uh, performance degradation because they're both in one block. And so that's why you'll see a lot of flow graphs in this setup where it's a host RFNOC host transition or flow graph that they, they always have two blocks. So it doesn't have to be a FIFO block. It could be any other RFNOC block, but it needs to be two of them. And that's one of the reasons why often sometimes people fill their block with lots of FIFOs, depending on how they're debugging, that they may need them to, to fulfill this, this situation. Okay, so that concludes our portion of this workshop that's the hands-on part and making your own RF knock block and doing a deep dive into the FPGA your UHD GNU radio integration. Next, I'd like to discuss some advanced topics in RF knock. Two of them are, are writing a, a C++ application for RF knock using only UHD and not GNU radio. And then the second topic I'd like to, to go over is we talked a lot about how to use command slash control packets, how they work in terms of doing settings bus writes, basically writing user registers or reading user registers into their blocks, but we don't have an example that we've seen yet. And so as one of the advanced topics, I am also going to go over how to write a register in another block in a, especially a meaningful situation, which would be tuning the DSP offset in the DDC and duck. And, and I'll go into more detail about what that really means after going over our UHD C++ app. So, RFNOC apps do not have to use GNU Radio. We know that. We can write a C++ application that just uses UHD, and that's it. Let's look at some example C++ code that shows how to use our gain block purely in C++ with UHD. So I'm going to open up an example here. This is in the RFNOC tutorial complete directory. It's underneath apps. And it's called RFNOC gain example.cpp. So this is already filled out, ready to go. In the slides, I talk about how to fill in 
some parts of the code, but in this case, it's already filled out. This is what we're going to go over is the already completed one. So I'm going to go to the bottom and start off in our main function. So first we have right here parsing some command line options, UDP address, UDP port, samples per packet. We're, we're creating a uh, sine wave here with this example. So we have the sine wave, or the, the uh, wavetable length determines the frequency and we have the amplitude here. Now, when we create a C++ app, this is done sort of behind the scenes automatically for us and when we use GNU Radio. But if you're writing it yourself, what you need to do is first you need to create a device three object. You can think of that as analogous to we're creating the usurp object that has you know, various features and functionality. And that's why we call it the usurp variable right here. So as part of this device three object, we have a method called get block control. This is going to get our block controller. We're going to find the FIFO block and the gain block. Now, technically, we didn't really have to use the FIFO block. That was a GNU radio issue that we needed to have two blocks in our flow graph. When it comes to C++ apps, we don't need to. But I wanted to show how, how we connect blocks using the C++ API. So I went ahead and grabbed the FIFO block along with the gain block so we can show that next. So after we have our block controllers, and like I said, this is all done for us when we're running GNU Radio sort of behind the scenes. It's, it's doing these sort of calls behind the scenes for us. We just don't know it. So when we next create our flow graph and, and connect up our blocks, we create our graph here with this call create graph. And then we do graph connect. Now here's an interesting thing to notice. This API right here is kind of similar to what we see in the test bench infrastructure. Uh, this was purposely, there's tried to do some mirroring here. It's not exact, but it does have a similar flow. Next, we'll set up our receive and transmit streamers. If you're not familiar with these, basically it's our way of streaming both samples to the USRP and receiving samples from the USRP. These are objects that allow us to do this. They have their own set of methods that allow us to do this that I'll go over shortly. So when we set up our stream, we are going to connect the RX stream or where are we going to be receiving samples from? What block? Well, we're going to receive it from the gain block control or the game block. So we're going to use the game block controller to get its block ID. And we're going to set in the RX streamer arguments, we're going to set the block ID to the game block, so I, um, knock, knock block ID or knock ID. So basically what we're doing is we're setting up here streaming from the game block back to the host. So here we get, get our RX stream. Here's our streamer. The transmit is, okay, wh where are we going to send our sine wave or, or samples to what block? Well, we're going to send it to the FIFO block because up here we can see we did FIFO block connected to the game block. So, you know, with our TX stream here, you can think logically what's happening here. We're using the TX streamer to stream samples to the FIFO block, which will, in the FPGA, stream samples to the game block, which will then stream samples back to the host via the RX. It will be able to receive those samples via the RX streamer. And then down here, we set up a couple of threads to do some interesting things. The TX thread, this is what we'll use to send our sine wave to the FPGA. RX thread will be how we receive samples from the FPGA. Then we have the set gain thread to allow some user interaction to set the game at, gain at runtime. So let's look at these threads. The TX thread, it's at the top here. Here we set up our sine wave table. So we'll be able to create samples for the sine wave. 
we set up our sample buffers. We set up some metadata describing how are we going to uh, stream. You know, does this, is this a timed streamer? No, we're, we're not going to do time streaming, so it's false. We're not going to set end a burst or start a burst. Then we just have a loop here. It's waiting on stop, which is this variable will be set in another thread, the uh, set gain thread. But basically, we just keep looping here. We fill our buffer from the wavetable, and then we send our buffer here with the X stream send. And uh, there's a little bit of an issue with the UDP sources with GNU Radio 3.7. If we start sending too many packets to it too quickly, they'll actually, they might drop packets. So we just have a kind of dummy sleep here to, to prevent that. The Rx thread, you know, we pull in the UDP address and port. So here this is setting up just a, you know, simple UDP socket here. And uh, we're setting this up so we can send UDP samples to GNU Radio. This is something that's just built into to UHD, actually. And I'm, I'm kind of reusing that code for my own purposes. We're going to start streaming here. This is, uh, when, you, when you do streaming on the RX side, when you receive samples, you need to set up a stream command. In this case, we're going to go ahead and stream and keep streaming. Stream mode, start continuous. So just stream and, and keep doing it. We want to stream right now. This is another case where if we want to do a timed command where we say, oh, I want to stream you know, 20 seconds in the future. This, this is kind of how you do it, except you wouldn't stream now. You would, you would use the time command. And you know, as I go through this, of course, the UHD manual and, and examples yeah, there are examples on how to do that, but I'm not going to cover them in this workshop. The RX stream right here, we issue the stream command, so it's going to start streaming. Now we go into this while loop like in the TX thread where we receive samples and place them in a buffer. There's some metadata. So this metadata, well, what happens if, uh, say, we receive an error here? Well... In this case, it's going to say, oh, okay, well, if we received an error, say we had a timeout. In this case, we just never received any samples. Well, then we'll go ahead and automatically stop. Uh, otherwise, we'll go ahead and print the error, and then we're going to come back and try again. But if there's no errors, we'll take those samples and we'll send them over UDP to actually a GNU radio full graph that I'll show shortly running. Finally, there's the set gain thread. Real simple here. Just keep looping again while not stop. And uh, you can enter the gain and change it in the runtime and control C to finish running the application. Pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and open the GNU Radio Flow Graph. So we're actually already there, RFNOC, RFNOC workshop source, RFNOC tutorial complete examples. There's a RFNOC gain CCP, cpp.grc file. So if we open that up, so what we're doing is we're sending you samples over UDP from our C++ app to GNU Radio. Why? Because, well, GNU Radio is good at visualizing things like this. Uh, if I didn't plot this in your radio, you just have to trust I was really receiving the samples. This at least gives us a visual component. So we just receive the samples and plot them. So I'll go ahead and start that here. Now right now, we're not receiving anything. So nothing's going on. I'm going to source our setup end file and then since we've already installed from the rfnoc tutorial complete directory there should be an rfnoc gain example here and we'll just leave the default values it should just run here it goes let's see and there you are pretty neat huh
Now I did. I only set it to to change the gain. I I, I didn't change the frequency. I don't allow you to change that. But let's see what happens when I change the gain. Uh, let's try zero point. Well, let's try five. Because uh, the gain is uh, is an integer, right? So by default, if I set it back to one, uh, looks like we are about point. One one. So if I, I guess if I set this to ten, then we should see the wrap around. There we go. So it works. And if you wanted to change the frequency, you could, you know, if we if we type help here, we we could. Well, we could see that. Uh, in that case, it looks like help may not be. An option. Let's let's take a look here real fast though at the example here. I should have called help, but I guess it, it didn't in that case. So either way, you can uh, we could use this right here. The default value is 200, so I guess if we make the way the table smaller, we should be able to have a higher frequency. So we'll say wavetable length equals 20. There you go. And you can see it's, it's moved out here a bit further. So there you have it. Uh, one thing I'd like to bring up, if you're running this example for yourself, we need to go down to that slide here real fast, is if you see an error, make sure you're running the GNU Radio Flow Graph first. You might see this error where if you run the application first, you get you know sending UDP packet failed because there there is no nothing for it to communicate. There is no socket server set up over in GNU Radio running. Okay, so that was the uh, pure C++ app that's available for you to look at and modify if you want to uh, create your own C++ RF knock application. Now next, let's talk about using command or also called control packets to set registers in other blocks. So as we looked earlier in, in the presentation, we, we know that Knock Shell has this interface called command out ack in. Command out is the control packets that will go out of your block to another block, and ack in is the response packets that would come in. That command out port you know, allows us to send command packets that will set registers and other blocks. And the nice part is you can do that on the FPGA without any host interaction. So for example, what an interesting use case might be is what about in the radio core block? We, we could use that to maybe retune the front end without incurring the host latency of, of having the host have to send that, those commands say over ethernet to the X310. So maybe you could do a fast tuning case. Uh, this example is an interesting one because actually there's a lot of, there's a couple of spy commands you have to send. And so on the X310, it would take a little bit of work, but it's totally doable. Now the example I'm going to show is similar in concept, except it's a DSP tune. The idea is that the DDC, the digital down converter, and the digital ELP converter, digital down converter, being basically you're decimating along with a optional frequency shift. Similarly, but opposite is the digital up converter is you are interpolating or increasing your sample rate with also an optional frequency shift. What we could do is we could have an RF knock block do that, set that frequency shift or offset tune without having the host involved at all. Or what we could do in the DSP tune case block 
the case, the block that, that I'm showing off here, this example, is what if we wanted to do hopping? What if we wanted to hop through a list of frequencies really quickly? Far faster than what you could do with, say, the host computer in the loop. Well, this code is located, again, in the RFNOC tutorial complete directory. We're going to open up the tutorial underscore dsptune.grc flow graph. This block is located in the usurp x310 rfnoc hg underscore 2 uh, bitstream. So let's go ahead and open that flow graph. So here we go. I'm going to run the flow graph first before showing some code. So in this case, we have our signal source. Again, we're going to a FIFO here. Technically, we didn't need it because you know, we have two blocks here. But we're going to a FIFO through our DSP tune block and then our DVC block. One interesting thing uh, that I bring up or I show in the code here is that this DSP tune block has to be in front of the DVC block. Why? Well, it actually needs to know when it sends these command packets, what block am I sending it to? What is its stream ID, its address? How does it, how would we know? Well, we could hard code it. Or what we could use is that next destination stream ID signal that we saw in the FPGA coming out of Knockshell. We could just reuse that for our own purposes to know that as long as our next block in line is the DVC or the duck, we, we don't have to know the stream ID. It will just use the next destination stream ID. Okay, so we'll run this. And then here we go. So we have our signal source and our fast noise source. One thing I will go ahead and bring up is if you see this timeout on channel zero, don't worry. We're running in a virtual machine. Sometimes performance, you know, get performance hiccups. That just means that there was a timeout. You know, the virtual machine probably had a little hiccup there and didn't receive samples for a while. So no problem there. Now let's uh, let's see what's going on here. So I have a offset tuning frequencies. I have a list of frequencies here I want to tune between. Then I have a delay of point one seconds, so 100 milliseconds. I can't adjust the frequency here, but it doesn't really do anything because actually that one has to do with the radio, so that, that's not gaining us anything here. But we can adjust our this frequency here. This is our sine wave frequency. So if I click on the offset tuning frequencies box and hit return, we can see that it hops between frequencies. We're making this sine wave hop here by doing offset tuning. And this offset tuning is happening purely on the FPGA. All I'm doing is I'm sending this list of frequencies to the DSP tune block, and then it's sending them out one after another to the DDC block with a delay between the command packets going out of 0.1 seconds, 100 milliseconds, or yeah, 100 milliseconds. Of course, I could make that delay smaller, 10 milliseconds. And I have to, I have to hit return there to update it, to send the, the packet here. It won't update by itself. So it's, it's going so fast, you can't really see it update. So we'd have to slow this back down Now this list, by design, can be up to 256 values long. Um, and of course, you know, we could change this on the fly here. So now we're just doing the lower half. So looks like we had a little bit of an error there. Let's try again. There you go. Okay, so let's take a look at the code. 
So we're back in our rfnoc tutorial complete directory. If we go to rfnoc FPGA source, we can see we have our knockblock DSP tune code already written. If we look through here, go down to the bottom, we can see we have registers for setting up a list of frequencies to hop over. That's this one. You'll see this is called Axi Settings Reg. This is a settings register that has an Axi Stream output that can be very useful in cer certain circumstances. And the neat part about this too is it has an option to include a FIFO. In this case, FIFO size 8, so 256 frequencies can be loaded in here. One thing to also know is, well, what if you sent 512 frequencies? What would happen? Wouldn't this register overflow and cause maybe a problem? In this, in this block's case, it will actually drop those extra frequencies or those extra settings register rights. It won't keep them in the FIFO. It, it won't overflow. It'll just drop them. There's actually a signal that's not shown here, uh, an error signal that will let you know that that situation occurred. We have another settings register here, the time offset. So this is how we're, this register is going to allow us to time between hops or hopping between frequencies. Right here, this, this bit of code right here is a state machine. It's pretty straightforward. What we do is we have an idle state. If we end up getting a signal frequency T valid, when, if it's asserted, then uh, we go ahead and check do we have a time offset? If we don't, let's just go ahead and start sending out this command packet. If we do have a time set, let's wait. Time offset being our settings register, our time offset settings register there. So here we wait. Now we go over here to our send header. We wait for command out T ready. That's off of knock shell to be ready. If knock shell is ready to accept our packet, then what we do here is we set the, the data. We're manually creating our, pack, our packet header here. So if we're in state, the header state right here, command packet is what we're going to send. Uh, we don't have an end of burst flag or time. Sequence number. So we have a sequence, sequence number that will track ourselves and increment ourselves. This is the length of the packet. It's pretty short. It's, this is in bytes, so you know we have uh, you know 16 bytes here. Source uh, stream ID, which is in next desk stream ID. You know these are both coming out of knock shell. And then if our state is Anything else, which in this case is meaningful to us, will be S command. We set SR frequency adder as the address, which is defined up here. And we use the frequency data. These just happen um, to correspond correctly in the DDC and the duck. If, if this address for setting the offset tuning was something other than 128, we, we, wouldn't, we would just have that here. But in this case, they do line up nicely. Now sending this packet, you know, we have to set T valid and T last. So the packet is valid in the header and command states. Otherwise, it's not. Here's an interesting thing that I said way earlier about Axi Stream. You know, when, if it's not valid, then T data and T last can be ignored. Notice here that, well, what about if we're in the idle and wait states? Well, it's going to be this data here. Shoot. You know, who knows what this data might be? Who cares? Because, well, we know what this will be, but we don't know what frequency T data will be, but we don't care because unless it's in the, the header or command states where it's actually, we know it's going to be set properly, that's when it's valid. And then, this command out T last, 
we say, okay, S, the, the command state here is when that's the last word we're going to be sending out. Otherwise, it's zero. And we're always going to accept response packets from that block. We don't even do anything with them. We just drop them on the floor. We don't look at the other signals. We just say, hey, we're always ready to accept a packet. And that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and look at some other code for our block. I could go over the Knox script, but I won't. It's pretty straightforward. I don't, oh, there is a test bench actually. Uh, I suppose we could try running the test bench. See what happens. Let's go ahead and open this up while that's running and let's take a look at the test bench code here, see what happens here. Looks like we send a set of frequency commands and then we check and make sure that the frequency commands are correct. So this is pretty straightforward. We, uh, we just check the block by itself. And just send a set of frequency commands through writing it to our time at offset and our SR frequency. And then when we get, when we receive the command in our uh, test bench, we read off of the settings bus, we read that bus write, and then check and make sure that the value is what we expect. And here we go, that test bench passed. So that, you know, this is a good test bench maybe you can take a look at if you want to see in the case of, okay, how do I write a test bench where I'm writing registers and I want to check to see, like, are those registers written correctly by checking the actual bus itself? This could be one to look at. We also have our block controller code. Here, DSP block controller code. This is a bit more sophisticated. This is a block that we actually need to have block controller code. The reason being is that we're sending a list of frequencies. We're not just sending them one at a time. If we were sending them one at a time and we didn't want to do, even if we we're doing some manipulation, actually, we would still could use the default block controller for just sending one at a time. And we said, okay, uh, in GNU Radio, We'll, we'll manipulate GNU Radio so it just calls, say, set arg one at a time in a loop. Uh, we could have done that, but in this case, we didn't. We actually set up a custom block controller, which is a nice example to see how to set up a block controller in UHD that does something useful. In this case, sending a list of frequencies. So we have the set frequency method here. We do a little bit of checking, make sure we make sure our vector of frequencies here isn't bigger than 256. Here we, we make sure that our frequencies are valid. We also get the sample rate, which is nice. So that way we can do a conversion because when you're setting these frequencies, you want to make sure that you set the frequency correctly based on the sample rate because the tuning offset is done as sort of a relative value based on you know number of clock cycles you can think of it which is re it's relative uh, to the block sample stream rate coming in it, the, the sample rate that's coming in and so there needs to be some adjustment there to make it be a f to relate it to the actual absolute frequency that we want to set it at. Interesting thing down here is this guy right here sets up a lot of this macro sets up a lot of 
of useful stuff. And so if, if you're ever editing your own blocks, uh, make sure to pay attention that, that you set this, this line here correctly at line 80, that you've you know, set DSP block controller and DSP team. Now, if you're using RF knock mod tool, it'll do it for you automatically. So generally, it, it'll be correct. What's also useful to look at is the GNU radio block controller. That's also, or block, a GNU radio block that we created, the C++ block for the DSP tune block. So since we have a block controller that we're actually calling thing, in this case, set frequency on, we need to expose this in GNU radio. Technically, we, wouldn't, we don't have to, but it's useful because we're wanting to, again, send a list of frequencies. So in this case, we just expose right here this guy DSP tune impl set frequencies. All we're doing is just calling the block controller and then calling the method set frequencies and just passing this vector of floats to it. Nothing too wild here, pretty straightforward. Okay. So that shows off our DSP tune block and how we can create a block with a list of frequencies, send those to this DSP tune block. It can create command packets for us and hop through these offset tunes or these hop through frequencies by adjusting the offset tuning of the DDC or, or duck block and do this very quickly, far faster than you could do with the host in the loop. Uh, you know, we're talking on the order of, I haven't measured it, but I would imagine on the order of hundreds of, potentially hundreds of nanoseconds to implement this sort of tuning. Now, if you were trying to tune the front end, it'd be slower because those were spy rights, but still they could, well, they, they would be faster than having the host in the loop if you implemented a, a similar block that instead of using the DDC, used the radio core block and, and issued the spy rights that were necessary to the RF front end to do fast frequency hopping. So this concludes the advanced topic section of the workshop. As a final takeaway, I'd like to say that RF knock is for FPGAs as GNU radio is for general purpose processors. Both provide an infrastructure for SDR applications, but they do not write your, write your code for you. They take care of the boring parts so you can focus on your application. I hope you found this workshop useful and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time on the USERT mailing list or at support at edis.com. Thank you.